will be taking our thoughts this morning. But before we do, let's just add, ask God's blessing on our time together. Lord, we do thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Every word of scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable to us. Lord, we pray that as we look into this passage, maybe not the most familiar passage of scripture, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would open up our eyes and our understanding. Or to realize that when Jesus was born into the world, he came, the Son of God, to be our Savior, our Redeemer. And Lord, we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of months ago, on October the 7th, Israel suffered the worst civilian massacre in its history as a modern state. It was also the deadliest assault on the Jews since the Second World War. Over 1,200 Israelis were killed in cold blood, and about 250 more were taken hostage in a coordinated attack by the terrorist organization Hamas. Many of the victims were killed in such a sadistic and brutal way that the world's media opted not to show the pictures or the stories. As a result, the world in general remains largely ignorant of just how horrific the events really were. The unprovoked October 7th attack has resulted in a war now being waged between Israel and Hamas. Sadly, many innocent people and children on both sides of the divine have been caught up in these circumstances beyond their control. Surely, we can at least pray that the hostilities will soon come to an end, that the hostages will be returned safely to their families and unharmed, and that the innocent will be protected from further suffering. Unfortunately, this is not the first time that the Jews as a people have suffered in their history. Over the last several thousand years, it's been a story of ongoing conflict and oppression and suffering. It hasn't even been a hundred years since the Holocaust, when over six million, can we get our head around that? Six million Jews were systematically tortured and cruelly put to death under Germany's Nazi regime. And yet here we are again. How do you explain it? Almost without exception, wherever the Jews have settled in the word, world, sooner or later, they seem to suffer persecution. No people have been so victimized as they. So much so that uniquely, they have their own word for it. Anti-Semitism. A story has been told that after the assassination of the Russian Tsar, Alexander II, a government official in Ukraine, with a hint of menace in his voice, said to the local rabbi, I suppose you'll know who is behind it. Ah, the rabbi replied, I've no idea. But the government's response will be the same as always. They'll blame the Jews and the chimney sweeps. <laughs> Why the chimney sweeps? asked the official, a little confused. Why the Jews? replied the rabbi. An atheist once asked a believer if he could prove the truth of the Bible with just one word, and the believer replied that he could. Well, asked the atheist, what's the word? The believer said simply, Jew. How do you explain that? Of all the peoples who inhabited the ancient world, the Jews are the only ones still with us. We don't talk about Hittites and Hivites and Jebusites and Amorites anymore. And yet no people has been more persecuted in history. Through it all, miraculously, we might say, they survived every attempt to destroy them. Our passage today comes from the Old Testament. That's the book of Daniel. It's the story of a prophet who lived two and a half thousand years ago. His story, however, doesn't take place in Israel, as you might expect. Far from it. Daniel lives in Babylon, a city far to the east. Daniel lives there along with tens of of thousands of his fellow countrymen. Why? What are they doing there? Why are they not living in their homeland? <coughs> well, you see, by the time of our story, Judea was a conquered territory. Many years before, the armies of Babylon had come sweeping through the land. They'd killed many in battle and taken many more thousands captive. 
Judea had been left all but desolate, an impoverished backwater in the Babylonian Empire. It had been decades now since Daniel had first been taken captive. He'd grown old in Babylon. Whole generations had grown up in exile. Only the oldest, left surviving, could remember the land of their fathers. They wrote sad songs about their exile. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there, those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who wasted us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. They cried out to God, How long, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long, Lord, will you be angry with us? How long will you hide yourself? <clears throat> well, today's text in Daniel chapter 9 is a prayer. It's a prayer that Daniel prayed. He prayed it earnestly, pleading with God to have mercy on his people and to allow them to return to the homeland. Daniel himself, by this time, was likely too old to travel. Chances were high he'd never get to see his country again. But this didn't stop him from praying for his people, praying that God would deliver them once more. So what was it then, on this particular occasion, recorded for us here in Daniel chapter 9, what was it that caused Daniel to pray, that prompted him to pray? We know from the scriptures that Daniel was a man of prayer. It was his habit to pray three times a pray, three times a day. He spoke often with his God. Here we have one of his prayers written down for us in the Holy Scriptures. There's a reason why. Not only do we have here an, an excellent example of a prayer of confession and supplication to God, but this prayer is included for another reason. Because of the amazing answer Daniel got from God. So today, we're going to start by looking first at the prayer and learning what we can from this prayer. And then we're going to focus our attention at the answer. Because in the answer we have what is, in my opinion, one of the most extraordinary prophecies in all the Bible. So Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the seed of the Medes, that's Artaxerxes, more familiarly known in, in uh, history, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the Lord, word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. The first thing that we learn here is that Daniel's prayer was prompted from his reading the word of God to the prophet Jeremiah. Look at verse 2. There it says, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. That he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek my prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Sometimes people tell me they find it difficult to pray. They struggle with knowing what they should pray for, what to say. A piece of advice I was given many years ago as a young Christian was this. If you don't know what to pray for, find a promise in God's Word and pray it back to Him. You know there's wisdom in that. There's much guidance and power to be gained in prayer from the reading of God's Word. The more you know of the Word of God, the more you will know of the heart of God. And the more that you understand God's heart, the more, more you'll understand what to pray for. In fact, the Bible tells us that our prayers are most effective when we pray according to the will of God. Remember the Lord's Prayer? We all quote it, the prayer that He gave to His disciples. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. What? 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus not only taught us, but he did by example too. We find him in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was facing the cross, praying out to his Father in heaven, O Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. You see? So here's Daniel. He's reading his way through some of the scrolls one day, containing some of the writings of the prophet Jeremiah, when all of a sudden something catches his eye. There was a prophecy. A prophecy that mentioned God had a plan to return the Jews back to their homeland. Why don't we go back to the book of Jeremiah for just a moment, and we can take a look at the exact prophecy that Daniel was reading. So it's, da it's Jeremiah chapter 25. If you're in Daniel, you go towards the front of your Bible, you go through the book of Ezekiel, that's the next big one, and then you'll come to Jeremiah. It's only a couple of books away. Jeremiah 25. I'm going to begin reading in verse 8. I'm not going to read the whole prophecy. Jeremiah 25 and verse 8. Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, said the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, and against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about, and will destroy them, and make them an astonishment, and a hissing, and perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones, and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon. And that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolation. Now bring upon that land all my words which I pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against the nations. Not a lot of background there, but by hundreds of years, is God has been given Israel chance after chance after chance, and yet they continually disobeyed. So at this point said, okay, fine, have it your way. And uh, so they were, uh, the Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was prophesied to come, and sure enough, he came and conquered the land and left it just as God has said in desolations. Here Jeremiah prophesied Israel would be taken captive, that the land would be left desolate. Well that prophecy had been fulfilled a long time ago, in Daniel's own lifetime. He lived through it. What caught Daniel's eye this time when reading this particular passage was the promise in verse 11 where it states that he will Come in seventy years, I've just lost it, there we go. This land shall be a desolation, and they shall serve the king of Babylon for seventy years, and at the end of seventy years, he will bring deliverance. Seventy years. Daniel begins doing the sums in his head. He adds up all the years since he and his fellow countrymen were taken captive, and he realizes something. Those seventy years are almost up. They're coming to an end. Does this mean that they would soon be able to return to their homeland? At that particular moment in time, nothing seemed more unlikely than that the king would let the Jews go back home again. But Daniel was not one to let the impossible keep him back. He wasn't going to let a little thing like something impossible in his mind to keep him from praying. Because you see, Daniel knew his God. Daniel knew that there's nothing too difficult for the one who made the heavens and the earth by his great power and outstretched arm. You know, I think all too often we give up too quickly. We give up too easily on praying because we think the situation is impossible. We can't see a way out of it. So we think there's probably little that God can do either. How often must we go without because we don't have enough faith to pray? The Bible says in John, James chapter 4, You have not 
because you ask not, or because you ask amiss, you ask selfishly. Daniel could pray with confidence, because now, having read the Word of God, he understood God's will in this. Here is a specific prophecy revealing exactly what God intended to do. He intended to allow the people to return again to their homeland. Daniel could hardly believe his eyes. But there's no denying it. There it was, right in front of him, as plain as could be, the promise of God. But wait, someone might ask, if that was what God said he was going to do, why then did Daniel need to pray about it? That's a question maybe not so easily answered. But maybe that's one of the reasons why this story is included in the scriptures, to remind us that it's important to pray, to teach us there's something about prayer, that even when we know something is God's will, we still need to pray. And for ha- in fact, perhaps we should be praying all the more precisely because we know it's God's will. I can't pretend to understand how our prayers fit in with God's sovereign will. No one can. But we know we must pray. And often it seems God is just waiting for us to have enough faith to ask before he will act. Someone has said, God is more ready to answer than we are to ask. So let's not be the ones holding back the blessing of God because we're unwilling to pray. Daniel prayed. He prayed based on the knowledge of God's word. Far from making his prayer irrelevant, we find that Daniel prayed all the more earnestly. Perhaps Daniel's intercession here was a link in the chain that led to God ultimately fulfilling his plan. God had purposed long ago that he was going to deliver his people. Yet, somehow his actions seem to hinge on the prayers of his people, those with enough faith to ask. I wonder, what has God laid on your heart to pray about? Are you praying for it? Are you praying for it earnestly? Are you praying from a heart of faith, believing that God will and can answer your prayers? And when God does give his answer, Whatever that answer might be, sometimes it's not always the answer you expect. Can we accept it? And remember to give thanks to God for His abundant grace. There's another thing I want to point out about this prayer before we're moving on. Look back again, we're back in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1. It's just the fact that this whole chapter is Daniel's prayer. It starts with these words. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the seed of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. And then it goes on to tell us about Daniel's prayer. Here at the beginning of the chapter, our attention is specifically directed to the fact that Darius is now king over the entire realm of the Chaldeans. And then for the rest of the chapter, it's all about Daniel praying. From a human perspective, who is Daniel? Next to the king who ruled over a mighty empire. Yet Daniel, in his prayer, wielded more power than all the power that the king had at his disposal. Because through his prayer, Daniel was tapping into the power of the one who made the heavens and the earth. It's been said that prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Daniel, on his knees, was a mightier man than Darius on his throne. So so Daniel went to God in prayer. But why? Well, he read the promise from God's word. So why did he feel this need to pray? Verse 20 reveals something very interesting about Daniel's prayer. If you want to drop down to verse 20. It says, While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin." And the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplications before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of God, for his homeland. Here we're told that Daniel's prayer was mostly a prayer of confession, confessing sin, seeking God's mercy and forgiveness. 
Okay, well, what's so unusual about that? We might say, isn't that partly what prayer is for? So that we can confess our sins to God? But here's the interesting thing. Read through the book of Daniel. Daniel hadn't done anything wrong. At least nothing that we're told about it. The Bible generally has quite a lot to say about the imperfections and the failures of the people included in its pages. But interestingly, no sin, no mistake is ever mentioned on the part of Daniel. Now realize, no one's perfect, that's a given. I'm not saying that Daniel never sinned. The only person on earth who ever lived that did not sin was Jesus. But what I'm saying here is this, that Daniel didn't do anything particularly wrong, that we, we, but yet still we see him praying this prayer of confession. He's praying on behalf of his people. He's praying for his fellow countrymen. But he doesn't pray like the self-righteous hypocrite who looks down his nose at others who are, are beneath him. No, we find Daniel includes himself right in with those he's praying for. Look what he says in verse 20. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel. <clears throat> Daniel knew the importance of owning up, of admitting to one's sin and of confessing it to God. All too often what we do today is we try to hide it or pass the blame onto somebody else. We try to ignore it and get on with our lives as though perhaps we've done nothing wrong. But that's the worst thing we can do, to ignore our sin. In fact, it's deeply harmful to ignore it and to try and hide it. Among other things, putting <clears throat> off our sin only makes things worse. It feeds our self-deception and our hypocrisy and it adds to our sense of guilt. Ultimately, if we do not deal with it, it will lead to our heart being hardened further against God. Confession isn't just important. It's essential. It's crucial to your emotional health. It's crucial to your mental and psychological health. It's crucial to your spiritual health. If you've wronged another, the Bible tells us clearly, then you need to go and make things right with them, if at all possible. But we must always make confession to God. If you want to know God's forgiveness, His healing in your life, then you've got to ask Him for it. Confessing our sins, we're forced to acknowledge our own limitations and weaknesses. To acknowledge the fact that apart from God, we are vulnerable and weak, spiritually speaking. You can't make confession to God and hold on to your pride at the same time. The Bible tells us if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's an everlasting promise always open. You come, you will receive. So Daniel makes confession, not only for his own sins, but also for the sins of his fellow people, the Baptist countrymen. That's all well and good, you might say, but why should God listen to Daniel? Why indeed? God doesn't owe Daniel a thing. Why should Daniel think that God cares what happens to him? And his people. What grounds does Daniel have for believing that God will hear and answer his prayer? Look a little closer at the text and you'll find the grounds for his prayer. Daniel doesn't ask favor from God because he thinks he's somebody special, because he thinks he's somebody who has special favor with God, a special way in with him. No, Daniel's entire prayer is based on the fact of who God is, on the character of God. Daniel believes that God will hear and answer his prayer because God is just and merciful. The first basis for Daniel's prayer is the righteousness of God. Daniel prays with assurance because he knows God's righteous, God's fair, God is just. God will do what he says he will do and he will ever only do that which is good and right and best. He's a righteous God. And the righteous God keeps his promises. Look at verse 4. I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, by that the great God full of awe, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. 
We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and from your judgments. Neither have we listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to the kings and princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but unto us confusion of face as it is to this day. You see here, today Daniel mentions God is righteous. God keeps his covenant. He keeps his promises. And his promise is this, that if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. The second reason Daniel gives as a basis for praying to God is that not only is God a righteous God who keeps his promises, he will do what is right. But God is also a merciful God. He's a God full of compassion and ever ready to forgive. Look at verse 9. Daniel says here, to the Lord our God belongs mercies and forgives. Go back to verse 8. It sets up the contrast. O Lord, to us belongs confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes and to our fathers, because we sinned against you. Verse 9, but to the Lord our God belongs mercies and forgiveness, even though we have rebelled against Him. How often in the Bible do we come across the following words, that God is a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. Daniel mentions both of these characteristics, God's righteousness and God's mercy. Throughout his prayer, they come together again in the final appeal. Verse 18, he says, O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and behold our desolations. See the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you for our righteousness, because we've got none, but for your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. Listen and do and delay not for your own sake. Oh my God, for your city and for the people called by your name. Daniel understood that on the one hand, he and his people deserved nothing from God. He owed them nothing. But Daniel knew he could pray to God and ask for his help because he knows God to be both the righteous judge who will always do what is right and the Father of mercies who is all compassion. Well, such was Daniel's prayer. That's all we've got time to look at for this morning. But I want to move on to the next point before time gets away. Notice the answer to Daniel's prayer. This is where it gets truly mind-blowing. Daniel gets an answer all right, but he gets far more than he could ever have guessed. First of all, notice how long it took for Daniel to get his answer. Verse 20. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplications before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the visions at the beginning, was caused to pass swiftly and touch me about the time of the evening sacrifice. And he informed me and talked to me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, when you first began, when you first started to pray, the commandment came forth, and I am come to you, for you are greatly beloved. Part of the reason Daniel received an answer is because Daniel was praying in accordance with God's will. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 gives us this wonderful promise that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever it is that we ask of him, we know that we shall have the requests that we have asked of him. So Daniel knew, Daniel understood the heart of God, and so he prayed accordingly. And God sent an angel to him. The angel Gabriel, one of the only two angels that <coughs> names that are given in the Bible. But here's the angel Gabriel with an answer, just for Daniel. Incidentally, it's the same angel who appeared to Mary to tell her she was going to give birth to the Christ child. You know, we can learn something here about the way God answers prayer. 
God hears your prayers. Whenever you pray, as soon as you pray them. In fact, the Bible tells us God knows our thoughts even before we speak. If the answer is slow in coming, it's not because God is dragging his feet or hasn't heard your prayers. Someone has said God is too powerful to need to, need to delay and he's too merciful to be willing to delay. The timing of the answer is often part of the blessing. We're the ones who speak of delays because to us it looks like a delay. From our perspective, sometimes it can look like God is dragging his feet. But in fact, God answers prayer exactly when he intends to. Exactly when the time is right. Notice something else in the prayer, in the, in the answer. Something particularly touching. It's what the angel says about Daniel. In verse 23, he says, At the beginning of your prayers, the commandment came forth, and I've come to you. Because you... Are greatly beloved. Does this mean that God plays favorites? Of course not. But what was it about Daniel that gave him favor in God's sight? Surely, in part, it was because Daniel had been a faithful servant of God throughout his whole life. In Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, we read that as a young man, Daniel had purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. He sought to honor God and made that commitment very early on. And then by the time we get to him as an older man in chapter 6 and verse 10 we read that as an older man Daniel kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he had always done. Daniel was a faithful man, a faithful servant of God and so God heard his prayers. You know you and I have it within our grasp to have power with God. The promises are there for anyone who believes. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. Him that honoreth me, I will honor him. Psalm 37. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way unto the Lord, and trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And so many more promises like that. God has a perfect time for everything. He acts not a moment too late, nor a moment too early. God has all the time in the world at his disposal. After all, he created it. We, however, we try to predict the future. We want to know what's going to happen. There are those who rely on horoscopes and psychics and palm readers. These con artists are plenty, ready to prey on the gullible and the foolish. They're happy to relieve you of your hard-earned cash if you'll just give them a moment of your time. And then on the other hand, we've got experts in probability math and computer programs that help us to forecast what the future holds. But when all is said and done, these are only educated guesses. In the words of Horatia Bonar's hymn, My times are in thy hands. My God, I wish them there. My life, my friends, my soul, I leave them entirely to your care. Anyway, back to the answer to Daniel's prayer. You remember, through all this, Daniel's been praying about the end of the captivity, that God would allow his people to go home again, that they might be able to return to the homeland. Well, in verse 25, back to Daniel chapter 9 now, verse 25, he gets his answer. <coughs> know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince, shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troubled times. Here Daniel is assured that Jerusalem will be rebuilt. It will be restored. But in answering Daniel's prayer, God does take, he goes a step further. God lifts the lid on the future and gives Daniel a glimpse of something far greater that is to come. Israel would be restored to its homeland, yes. The walls of Jerusalem would be rebuilt again, but only temporarily. Israel would again fall into enemy hands. That's what the rest of the thing is talking about. Israel's story at this point is far from over. 
God is working out, though, something on a far greater scale than Daniel or even anyone else could ever have imagined. How often, by the way, have we set our hearts to pray about something without really fully understanding half of what God has in store? We pray for what we think is best, but God knows better. How often God has something else in mind? Something which we could never have guessed. And whatever God has in mind, you can be assured it will be better. But it all begins with our willingness to pray. Well, here is Daniel. He was willing to pray and God answers his prayer. And he shows Daniel something amazing. Look at verse 24. God gives Daniel a brief survey of his ultimate goal. His ultimate goals for the future. He says, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon your people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, to anoint the most holy. Now you need to understand the actual wording here. The King James translators has applied the word weeks, 70 weeks. The actual reading, word for word, is 77s, or 70 sets of 7. Biblical scholars are generally agree that what we have here are not 70 weeks of 7 days, but rather 70 weeks of 7 years. I don't have time this morning to go into all the significance of the number 70 as it's used here. It's fascinating as you see how all of Scripture fits together. It's absolutely amazing. It speaks with one voice, but we'll have to save that for another time. But what I want you to understand today is here we have a prophecy that looks far into the future. A prophecy that deals with God's timing. Here we have a set number of years. 70 times 7 or 490 years. And what does God say he will have accomplished at the end of this time period? Well, verse 24 lists six things. To finish the transgression. That means to bring an end to all spiritual rebellion. Has that happened yet? No, not by a long shot. To make an end of sin. To right all wrongs once and for all. To make reconciliation for iniquity. This, of course, would be accomplished when Christ the Messiah suffered and died on the cross. To bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up the vision and the prophecy. That means to, to bring all prophecy to conclusion. And then finally to anoint the most holy. To see Christ the Messiah exalted to the highest honour. That's God's ultimate intentions. But let's read on. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem... To Messiah, to the anointed, the prince, shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks, or sixty-nine altogether. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troubled times. And then after those sixty-two weeks, actually sixty-nine altogether, if you add the first seven, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Now I'm going to end my reading there, because that's all that concerns us for today. Did you notice the 70 weeks are broken up into smaller segments? The last week, the 70th week, hasn't happened yet. It's not been fulfilled. That week is yet to be fulfilled. It's described, those seven years are described in the book of Revelation, the very last book in all the Bible, the end times. But for now, it's the first 69 weeks that concerns us. Did you notice there's a reference in these verses to Messiah? The anointed one. That's what Messiah means. The anointed one. It's exactly the same word. Christ is the Greek for Messiah or anointed one. They're all the same word. So this prophecy is about Christ, the Prince. Here it tells us specifically that the anointed one, the Messiah, the Hebrew word is literally Messiah, okay, will be cut off. Here, in this verse, the death of the Messiah is prophesied. And not just any death, because it says the word cut off. It implies it won't be a natural death, but it will be a violent one. In other words, after these first 69 weeks, the Messiah, the Prince, will be put to death in a cruel and violent way. That's a time period of 483 years. 
And we're told that this time period begins with the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and that it will end with the violent death of Christ the Messiah. Now we know from both the biblical account and from historical records there are at least three separate commands that went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem at different times. But it was the last one, the one given by the Persian king, Artaxerxes, in 458 BC, that actually resulted in Jerusalem getting rebuilt. Now, I have to say, ancient history is not an exact science. All ancient dates have a bit of give and take with them. But I think it's pretty obvious that even with the short time we spent looking at it today, that the time span included in this prophecy very specifically, very clearly, points to the death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary and to no one else. Christ died for the sins of the world exactly when God said he would. Now I don't know about you, but that prophecy just blows my mind. Here we are told in no uncertain times exactly when the Christ of God would be here on earth and when he would die. Most Jews still today do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They're still looking for someone to come. My question is, when he comes, how will it be possible for him to fulfill this prophecy? The time's already passed. The simple answer is, no one else can fulfill it. Truly, Jesus, and Jesus alone, fulfills all that was ever spoken of him in the scriptures. Jesus himself said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have not come to fulfill it, uh, to destroy it, but to fulfill. And Jesus fulfills all that was said of him in the scriptures. And he fulfills it perfectly. Here we have a prophecy that predicts the life of Jesus almost 500 years before he was born. There's no record anywhere else in history of any such thing ever happening before or since. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. In closing, there's just one more thing I want to call to your attention. Verse 26. It tells us there that the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. He'll be put to death, but not for any crime that he had committed. He will die on the behalf of others. We come to the New Testament, and the Apostle Peter says, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that through his death we might live unto righteousness. It's by his stripes that you are healed. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for the sins of the whole world. He died for you and for me. He died to bring us salvation, forgiveness from sin, and the promise of new, eternal life. We may trust fully in Him with all our heart because we can know beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Saviour. Well, if you'll come and lead us 